Hello, and welcome to the Love Mia Vita podcast. I'm Jerry DiPiano, CEO of Fem Pharma. Thank you for joining me as we discuss all things women's health and wellness. Please note that this information is simply that. It's information to help you to think through your decisions. Please consult your medical practitioner to discuss your personal situation. Thank you. So I'm here today with Dr. Catherine Sharif on the Love Mia Vita podcast. And many of you know that Dr. Sharif and I co-host the Love Mia Vita podcast. And then we also have our invited guests. Catherine, for those that might have just tuned in for the first time, perhaps you could share a bit of your background. Sure. So I'm an internist at Thomas Jefferson University. And I'm a primary care physician, but I also do a lot of office gynecology. And our center, uh, Jefferson Women's Primary Care, we believe that women shouldn't have to go to two different doctors based on their anatomy. And so we're committed to providing gynecologic care. So you care for the whole woman. And as a professor of medicine, you're also very, you're also brilliant about many different topics that that incorporate both the sex-based difference and gender differences. And today we're going to chat about women in pain. And I say that kind of tongue in cheek because we are in pain for many reasons, but a lot of that pain is either ignored or if it isn't ignored, we aren't necessarily treating pain in the same way that we would treat the pain that men would experience. So just a couple of quick stats on this. The most recent data from the Centers for Disease Control has indicated that there are about 52 million individuals in the United States who experience chronic pain. And chronic pain is defined as pain that one experiences for more than three months. You might imagine it disproportionately occurs in women. So 22% Chronic pain sufferers happen to be women, 19% are men. And we also know that there are differences that are based on sex, gender, psychological, and social factors. And we want to explore some of that with you today. And so, Catherine, have you ever been in a situation where, as a woman, and you're a physician, but you're, you know, has your pain ever been ignored by a practitioner? It certainly has been. I have been in that position. And what's interesting is even uh, this, it's happened before I was a physician and after I was a physician and uh, my symptoms have been downplayed, even when the other, when the physician that I was seeing knew I was a physician, they still um, downplayed symptoms. Um, It's infuriating. And I have social status as a physician, and even that's not good enough to be taken seriously. It is it is very frustrating. And in fact, there's been a significant amount of research that's been done on what is determined as having a gender bias in the way women and pain are treated, or I should say that it's not addressed, that it may be ignored, or that it may be downplayed because women are considered to be emotional and more hysterical and could even be fabricating their pain. So this is definitely a gender bias. And we know that there's a difference between sex and gender. So just to remind those that sex are the organs that you're born with and gender is the way in which you identify yourself. So this is gender, right? Gender-based. So a Anyone that identifies as female, irrespective of the sex organs that they're born with, may experience the same type of thing. I mean, I can honestly say that I have been the victim of this sort of thing for most of my probably teenage and even adult life. So as a young woman, I had significant menstrual pain and went to my doctor primary care practitioner who happened to be a man. And he basically said, you should expect to have pain during your period. Well, significant cramping that 
keeps you from engaging in any activity where you feel like you want to stay in bed is not normal. This condition is called dysmenorrhea. And there are two types, as you know. One is primary, for which there is no underlying cause, but it could still it still needs to be addressed. And then the other one is secondary. In my case, it was secondary. It turned out that I had endometriosis. Thankfully, it was a mild case, but I ended up in an emergency room in my 20s, and I was told that I was hysterical. So it was only when I tried to conceive that I learned that I had endometriosis. Can you imagine? So pelvic, chronic pelvic pain that was dismissed. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, thankfully, I was still, I was able to be blessed with one daughter and now she's experiencing similar types of issues with her pain. So I think we want to dissect this a little bit. So, so let's, let's do that. Sure. So, you know, as an internist uh, in training, we didn't delve into much of any gynecologic issues. And I knew that endometriosis was a thing uh, which could make you infertile. And I didn't know much more about it. And that's because we weren't taught about it. And what I learned over the years is that there are so many women with endometriosis. So it's specific to women. It's sex specific if you have uh, women's organs and um, women suck it up every single day and they know not to bring it up or they, um, they will be called uh, drug seeking um, and you're considered a whiner and it comes around again month after month after month. And what I didn't understand when I first began to take care of women after my residency is I thought, yeah, yeah, cramps can be bad. Menstrual cramps can be pretty bad. I've had some pretty bad menstrual cramps. I had no idea what the mens what bad menstrual cramps really are like and that women stay home for work or school or they drag themselves in or they vomit and still just keep doing what they're doing. And that's the thing about sucking it up every month. They're afraid to bring it up and then they're conditioned to not bring it up anymore. It's appalling how much untreated pain is out there. It's really, and when you think about some of the other diseases and disorders, right? So diseases and disorders that disproportionately affect women, and these are really gynec mostly gynecological conditions that will affect women. But for example, women with breast pain. So some women have cyclical breast pain, which occurs in conjunction with their cycle, and it can be very significant and debilitating. Some women have non-cyclical breast pain. Bottom line is one out of every two women during her reproductive years may experience some form of breast pain. And it can be, it can be quite severe. We know we've Run, run clinical trials for women with fibrocystic breast condition. And we've ascertained that most of these women were told the following, stop drinking caffeine, consume more iodine, wear a tight bra, which doesn't begin to address the kind of pain that really is incapacitating pain for some of these women. And even for some that where it's not incapacitating, it still is the source of great emotional and psychological discomfort. So, so it plays out in many different ways and impacts women's quality of life. And again, no treatment option that is satisfactory that, by the way, doesn't put a woman in a quandary. And these women are not drug seeking, as in they're not looking for narcotics. What they're looking for is someone to validate their pain and to provide something more than a pat on the back. Well, you know, you, as you said, suck it up. That's, that's what we tend to do. We also know that women will disproportionately suffer from migraine. Yes. And um, it's becoming more common now for me to see a woman in her forties with decreased kidney function and I think, well, wait, she doesn't have diabetes. She doesn't have uncontrolled hypertension. Where did these kidney problems come from? 
why is she 70% instead of 90 or 100%? And it turns out that these are women with endometriosis and migraines who took handfuls of ibuprofen for years and years and years and knocked off their kidneys. So the consequences of being ignored, the consequences of having their pain underestimated led them to over-the-counter ways in which to address this, which is really like putting a Band-Aid on a hemorrhage. So it yes. really didn't do much to knock down the pain, but it made it somewhat bearable, somewhat, so they were somewhat able to function. But the consequences of chronic overuse of ibuprofen or other types of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which is what we're talking about here, um, not mentioning any brand names per se, is not trivial. And you just illustrated that. We know that with migraine treatment, because women do suffer disproportionately from migraines, there really isn't anything specific that looks at why is, mig is migraine part of the cycle? Is that part of the hormone cycle that starts during a woman's um, years she is menstruating and follows her through the transition periods of perimenopause and menopause? And by the way, we do know that sex hormones have an impact on most of these kinds of conditions. We're, we're learning that now it's a little late in the game, but at least we're learning that sex hormones do make a difference. So when we think about things like irritable bowel syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, migraine, as we just mentioned, some of the gynecologic conditions, you've seen them all as a, as a physician. Yes. And Women are really in a no-win situation. Let's say you're a young 25-year-old uh, woman with uh, menstrual cramps that are beyond belief and you're vomiting and there is no way you can go to work or go to school and you go to the ER. When you go to the ER and you say that you have your period and you have these uh, you know, bad cramps, you're shamed for showing up in the ER, you are treated um, as if you're drug seeking, but you've had no options. Let's say, uh, let's fast forward maybe 20 years and I send you to a nephrologist because I can't understand why your kidney function is so low. And, the nef and I've seen this, the nephrologist shames you for taking handfuls of NSAIDs to relieve your pain. And then to add insult to injury, let's take migraine and endometriosis. They both are associated with high estrogen levels. And, you know, maybe 100 years ago, people didn't have migraines and endometriosis. So how can we have them now? Where do they come from? Are they xenoestrogens? Is there any research about this? No. And so the only treatment is to treat you for pain but not what the underlying causes are. So then there's a lack of research. And this is, that comes full circle back to the young woman with endometriosis pain. You just can't win. So they, <clears throat> when we look at the different diseases and disorders that disproportionately affect women, you say, well, why do they disproportionately affect women? So you mentioned the estrogen link. We know that there is an estrogen serotonin link in depression. And so we know that the incidence and prevalence of major depressive disorder tends to be higher in women. When you look at certain autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, they tend to be higher in estrogen link. When you look at irritable bowel syndrome, higher in women, estrogen link. Obviously, the gynecological conditions that we just mentioned, endometriosis, chronic pelvic pain, interstitial cystitis. So if, you're, so if you're a woman listening to these, um, to this uh, podcast and YouTube video, you probably say, this could be me because there are a lot of us that are part of this problem. And the problem is that women have not been studied as efficiently and as, as effectively as men have. So men are the default and women are considered an aberration. It's still a problem in medical schools. Let's talk about the drugs that are used to treat these conditions. They were largely studied in men. 
And even after 1993, which is when pharmaceutical drug manufacturers and researchers were required to include women in studies, we didn't include a sufficient number of women in those studies. And then we didn't pull apart the data. We call it disaggregating the data. So we didn't pull apart the data to look at the differences from the time that you first women menstruated through all of the hormonal transitions. And that is a problem. So we actually don't know what we don't know. We're starting to, uh, we're starting to peel that onion apart, but we still don't know a lot about what needs to be done in terms of the drugs that are more efficient, what the right dosing is, what the right delivery is. And when I say delivery, I mean, put something in your mouth or should you put it in your pelvic and reproductive organs? Or should you just apply it to your breast if you have breast pain? And those are the sorts of questions that still plague us today. Yes. You know, I forget that whatever white women experience in terms of being dismissed for pain, it's 10 times worse for Black women and Hispanic women. Now, <clears throat> that's the bad news. But we always want to live, we always want to lead with hope because there are some things that you can do. And so, Catherine, what do you recommend? that women who are experiencing some of this can do to ad self-advocate? And what are some of the tools that you can insist are utilized in order to better assess a woman's pain? Well, you need to remain calm because you will be judged very quickly as being emotional and you will be dismissed if you don't regulate your emotions. Um, and you want to be taken seriously, and you need help from this person. Um, if the interaction is so disrespectful and the doctor is so dismissive, men or women, because women can also be dismissive, um, if that way, uh, you need to leave the practice and find another physician. Um, there are online groups uh, where, say, fibromyalgia or endometriosis, PCOS, and so on, where women come together and share their experiences. And it's very empowering because one of the things is when you don't feel good, you feel so isolated. Uh, you're like not, you're not your best self and not feeling like you're in a position to be able to argue with someone who has more social power than you do. Um, I educate myself as much as possible about your condition uh, as a, that would be one tool. So we often talk about, <clears throat> this is something that I did for myself. I, I have a diary. Uh, we use pain diaries a lot, really looking at when, when you experience this sort of pain. So let's say you're a woman who is in her 30s and you have been experiencing menstrual cramping, significant menstrual cramping since you started menstruating. Keep a diary. When does that pain become worse? Is it right before your period? Is it during your period? When does it subside or is it continuous? Are there other associated symptoms? You mentioned vomiting. Is it associated with vomiting? Do you have migraine with it? Do you have aura with it? Are you confined to your bed? So keeping that diary is actually quite useful because it becomes, yes, it is subjective because you are filling out your own diary to describe where you are during your menstrual cycle but it can be helpful when you go to your doctor. There are some measurement tools that are used to assess pain. Um, there's a visual analog scale, right? Which means that basically looking at things on a scale, you know, my worst pain to, I wanna just poke my eyes out kind of pain, right? So very severe pain. So there's a visual analog scale. Sometimes they use faces, right? They use emojis, smiley face to, frowny, crying, hysterical face. Then there's also a numerical scale that can be used, but you can, you can ask your practitioner to please let you look at a pain scale and mark your pain that way. So it becomes a more validated, I will say this, validated way for your practitioner to appreciate where you are in terms of the severity of your pain. And the numerical scores are actually quite helpful. 
in terms of determining what a practitioner might be able to do to support you during that. So those are some things, I mean, worked in this field for a long time. Do I know these questions to ask? This is, this is something that I encourage all women to arm themselves with. Take this as a recommendation. Take this knowledge into your healthcare practitioner's office. Ask for a pain scale, some form of pain scale, so that it, it perhaps can be more objective. Bring your diary with you. I think that's so smart uh, to your pain scale. It doesn't matter what it is. It's, it's um, um, forget how much pain you, you may forget how much pain you've been in or what days it's actually better and manageable, or maybe a five out of 10 instead of a 10 out of 10. Um, but is, um, I think it goes a long way uh, uh, to describe your symptoms to someone who doesn't walk in sympathetic. And unfortunately, we know that there is um, an opioid crisis in America. So physicians have have appropriately looked at this overprescribing narcotics as a potential hazard, a potential contributor to the crisis. And so we're not advocating that you ask for strong pain relief. However, what you may need to do is you may need to look at some other types of intervention. For example, if you have endometriosis, your practitioner may offer you one of the prescription products that are used not solely to, they're not palliative. They don't just address the pain. They, un, they address the underlying cause of the pain. So they are actually treatments for what is causing the pain. Ditto on things like irritable bowel syndrome or fibromyalgia or rheumatoid arthritis. We're not talking about narcotics. So we don't want you to walk away from this thinking that we're recommending that pain is undertreated and you should ask for something that is stronger because your physician may then say, well, this is you know, not something I'm comfortable doing because we know where we are. The thing is, we have gone so far in the other direction that um, you, you can't get pain for these conditions. You can't get pain meds for these conditions and they're perfectly appropriate. It's shameful. You know, it's re it really is quite shameful. I had I had the opposite occur, uh, but it was it's still women's symptoms being dismissed. So, local hospital went in excruciating pain. <clears throat> of course, they first dismissed the pain and said, "Are you still menstruating? Because you might just be having menstrual cramps." Now, I have a lot of experience in the field, and although I'm not an MD, I do understand the science and the physiology. So I was pretty sure that it was either diverticulitis, did it by self-diagnosis, or I probably had a kidney stone or stones because I kind of felt like flank pain radiating from the back. So I did my self-diagnosis, put on the bed and left in the emergency room unattended, unattended for four and a half hours writhing in pain. Oh dear God. Finally, someone came in and offered me Dilaudid. Because I wanted to know that I was getting the right diagnosis and I didn't want to lose consciousness, I said, no, I wasn't going to take any Dilaudid. I then had to use the restroom before I had my CAT scan. I'm going to do a CAT scan to see what was going on with my kidneys and or with my bowels. And they finally ascertained that it looked like I had kidney stones, but went to the restroom, passed the stones. And the nurse who happened to be a male nurse discarded my sample along with my stones. I was deemed to be a hysterical female that probably had a much more significant issue. It turned out that I actually did have kidney stones because that's what it showed on the CAT scan. I passed those stones. They did a follow-up CAT scan, but that's not what they put in the chart. So here I am, <laughs> a perfect example that was dismissed, that was yeah. left 
to suffer for four hours in an emergency room. And then ultimately the male nurse decided that I was a hysterical female and just tossed my sample. This story proudly repeats itself numerous times. So, so my message to women like me is to please advocate for yourself. Don't let anyone dismiss your pain. That's why it's helpful to keep these diaries. It's helpful to ask for, the, ask for these visual analog scales or some sort of measurement tool so that you can actually record your pain. It's also not acceptable to take what Catherine just shared with you as this is the, this is the fact, this is somebody that's going to put me in my place. In the most appropriate and kind way, you can be assertive. It's, it, really, it, it really comes down to that. You have to be assertive and advocate for your care, especially when it comes to some of these painful syndromes, because it may not be something to be dismissed. Yes, it could be a chronic painful condition that is not life threatening, but you may, but that may not always be the case. As the example of women who go into an emergency room with chest pain. Yes, uh, we used we used to have this thing called the Maylock sign. And this is uh, when you're a woman, especially a black woman who comes in with chest pain into the ER and you're put right away into the GYN room because surely you have an STD and this has nothing to do with your heart, even though your uh, vagina is down there and your pain is up here. So the Maylock sign is when the labs come back and someone realizes that you are actually having an MI and you're being wheeled to uh, the cath lab and uh, you have Maylox dripping out of your mouth because they gave you Maylox for heartburn um, instead of treating this appropriately. Um, I first heard this term and observed it uh, 30 years ago when a, a resident whispered in my ear and um, it's still, it's, it's unbelievable that to this day, we still misdiagnose women's um, cardiac problems. So this is, this is where, this is the example where your pain, your chest pain, if it is, if it's being dismissed, could have dire consequences for you. So again, you know your body or you should know your body. And if you feel that this pain is not indigestion because you haven't done a terrible job of eating fried foods and, and harming your body in other ways. But even if you have, if you are feeling crushing chest pain, you are probably not feeling heartburn. It is probably something more significant than that. And you can ask for an electrocardiogram. You can ask for more diagnostic work. You can ask that blood be drawn. Those are the sorts of things that you can you can request. Doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to be what will be re required, right? But someone should take you seriously. Yes, and so why aren't women taken seriously um, in in uh, healthcare, uh, women patients? And it's because healthcare is just a microcosm of our sexist society. One of the best talks I ever heard was from a researcher by the name of Bernice Sandler. And she was the author of Title IX in which women have to uh, have equal opportunity for sports at college. And Dr. Sandler gave this talk, which blew me away. She said, next time you're with a group of um, a group of men and women look around and see who makes eye contact with whom. We make eye contact with the people who we deem are the most important. So uh, I grew up as a good little feminist. My mother was in the Women's Liberation Organization and um, or the Women's Liberation um, uh, Movement. And so I understand about women not being taken seriously. So the next morning after that talk by Dr. Sandler, I was the chief resident and I was sitting at a table surrounded by nine residents, half men and half women. And 
I, I watched myself where my eyes went. And when I, my job was to ask questions, who was admitted last night? Uh, what was their diagnosis? How are they doing today? And so on. And what I tended to do is to skip over the women and ask the men questions. And I made more eye contact with men. And I saw myself doing it on rounds in the hospital. I would make contact with more male medical students than women medical students. And so, of course, we internalize uh, the lack of respect that we have for girls and women. We internalize it as women. And what's so dangerous is not knowing what you're doing. So I was appalled, um, but it, uh, it was an excellent lesson um, about taking women seriously. I was appalled at my own behavior, but at least I knew. Well, I think that, that being self-aware that you, that you come to this with some of your own gender bias by virtue of the training, right? So what you were exposed to your, your own training is so important. And there are probably women who are healthcare practitioners who are listening to this. So this is not an indictment, by the way, of healthcare practitioners. This is really, it starts with what we learn in high school or actually in junior high school or middle school, where you know sex education is really not, not handled properly. And it's what, a week or two weeks at the most, and it's all surrounds the menstrual cycle, but it really doesn't begin to teach us what we need to know about our bodies as women. Men are not brought into the conversation. That's a problem because then men don't have the same level of respect for women. They just know that the women were isolated, or I should say the girls were isolated for the talk. And then it, it is perpetuated if you're studying science at an undergraduate level, the textbooks are largely based upon the male body. And as I said early on, men are the default. It continues in professional school, whether that is for PhD programs or in medical schools. The male body is still the default. And all one needs to do is to examine medical school education to better gain an appreciation. So again, it's not to indict healthcare practitioners. It's what needs to change. And unfortunately, we do have the gender bias as we've discussed, and more so because women are considered emotional and men are considered brain, brave. So men are thought to be able to be more tolerant of chronic pain, don't complain as much and we know that that's not, that's not the case. It's not to say that there aren't some individuals that may be more hysterical. We know that there are psychological factors that play into this. There are social factors that play into this. Um, and and we, we understand too that there are gonna be some sex-based differences that need to be elucidated. So more recently, there was a study at the University of Arizona where they looked at the building block of pain called nociceptors. And they were able to see a difference in females and males in their response to pain. It is pretty exciting to see that because what that means is what we've said early on in this podcast, and that is that we may be able to more individually determine how pain is treated. And we may be able to look at sex-based differences in pain, ignoring some of the gender bias that exists and to be able to finally find ways to treat the pain with the right drugs, if that is the case, or at least provide the right treatment plan for women, which also helps men. That's true. When we learn more about women, we actually uh, learn more about men and about sex differences. So what are the three or four things that we want to leave with our audience, Catherine? Well, number one, if you have chronic pain, and you haven't been taken seriously, and you have been dismissed or shamed, um, I want you to know that you're not alone and it is not your fault. We live in a sexist society that does not 
uh, validate uh, women's concerns. So that's a that's that is a mouthful, and that is probably the biggest point that one can make. Uh, I think the second point is if you feel that your pain has been dismissed, and it is based on perceive what you perceive as racism, you need to switch your healthcare practitioner and find someone that can more objectively address you and your concerns. So I think that's number two, because we did talk about some of the racism in medicine. And number three, I think we talked about having some way in which to measure your own pain by using a diary so that you come prepared to discuss this with your healthcare practitioner. Let's face it, healthcare practitioners are challenged. You know that better than anybody, Catherine. How many patients do you see in a day? It's unbearable. Yep. <laughs> so your healthcare practitioner, if you can come prepared with something like a diary so that you can share with your healthcare practitioner, this is when I'm experiencing pain. Maybe it's during the, the time of the day. Maybe it's during various times during your menstrual cycle, or if you're not ex having your menstrual cycle, if you're perimenopausal or me menopausal, you know, when do you typically experience your worst pain? And what does that feel like? So describe your pain, if you can, in the form of a diary. So come prepared with that and come prepared with a list of questions so that you can make your time with your healthcare pr practitioner as efficient as possible. I agree. And um, yeah, so I'm not going to indict, um, you know, physicians and nurses um, about their behavior, but they, they do live in a sexist society and you're not immune to that um, if you're in the medical field um, and you, it's your responsibility to learn where your biases lay and um, to have a dispassionate eye uh, to look at how you behave. And if you're a patient and people are disrespectful, you need to call them out on it. And if you can do it calmly, even better. Great advice, Catherine. It's always a pleasure. So there you heard it from Dr. Catherine Sharif. And uh, we are just excited for you to self-advocate. And when it comes to pain, remember that we've all been there with you. You are not alone. And the most important thing to take away is self-advocacy. Pain may be something that can be ameliorated without drug treatment, but it should never be ignored. Absolutely. Thanks, Catherine. Until Thank next you, time. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you for joining us on the Love Me Avita podcast. Love Me Avita means love my life, and that is a mantra we should all live by. Please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and check out our website at fempharma.com. Remember to live well and love me, Evita. <laughs>